The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. economics oligopoly, which is uh, basically trying to move towards the most realistic uh, modeling of markets that we can. We've talked about two extreme versions of modeling markets. One is perfect competition, which is uh, the extreme case of perfect entry and exit, free entry and exit, perfect consumer information, sort of an idealized market. We know that doesn't really exist in practice anywhere. The second extreme was monopoly, which we do see in practice in some places, in particular where there's natural monopolies. Um, we do see that, but that still doesn't describe most markets. Most markets are probably better described by oligopolies. These are markets where there's more than one market player, yet where each firm is large enough to actually affect the price. So basically, an oligopoly market is where there be a small number of firms in a market with substantial ent barriers to entry from additional firms. Okay, an oligopoly market where there's a small number of firms with enough barriers to entry that additional firms don't enter. Okay, so the classic example of an oligopoly industry would be, say, the auto industry. Okay, here's a market with a small number of dominant players. There's been some entry and exit over time, obviously, but it moves pretty slowly. By and large, it's a market where there's very limited entry. And the question is, how do firms behave in this market? They aren't, obviously, it's not like perfect competition where they can sort of lazily take a price out of the market and just produce based on that price. But it's also not the same as monopoly where they can just get to set the price and not worry about what other people do. They're in this in-between situation where they have price setting power, they have some market power, but in a context where they have to worry about competitors, okay? And so in this context, there are two different ways firms can behave. It's important to sort of lay out to start two different ways firms can behave. They can behave cooperatively or non-cooperatively. If they behave cooperatively, we say that they form a cartel. So our cartel is what happens when oligopolistic firms, when firms in an oligopolistic market behave cooperatively to determine the outcome, we call that a cartel, okay? The classic example, of course, here being OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which is a cartel that drives the price of oil, okay? Those countries cooperate in how much oil they produce to move the price up or down according to what the group desires, okay? And essentially, what cartels do is essentially turn oligopolies into monopolies. So what cartelization does, what a cooperative equilibrium does, essentially say let's all get together and behave as if we're one big monopoly by cooperating. Okay? Now, and therefore, if you cooperate, you can get all the wonderful things monopolies get, huge market power, huge profits, et cetera. But as we'll talk about next time, it turns out to be pretty hard to get a cooperative oligopoly. There's lots of reasons why it might fall apart. And that's why in most oligopolistic markets, Firms behave, behave non-cooperatively. Okay, in most oligopolistic markets, firms are behaving non-cooperatively. They're competing with each other, not cooperating. Okay, and that's what we're going to spend today analyzing is the case of non-cooperative oligopolies. Okay, yeah. Uh, it depends on the context. Um, there is, uh, in the U.S., and I'll talk about this, in the U.S. there's antitrust legislation, which make, can make it illegal in many contexts to cooperate. Obviously, OPEC is not subject to some world legislation. Uh, but even in the U.S., there can be implicit cartelization, implicit cooperation, and we'll talk about that. It's a good, it's a good question. So technically, you're right. Technically, it is illegal uh, in the U.S. in most contexts to, to form a cooperative, to form a cartel. Uh, whether in practice those laws can be forced is, is an interesting and legitimate question. Um, 
OK, so but today we want to focus on the case of non-cooperative oligopolies. And to do so, we're going to turn to a new tool and one of the fundamental tools of economics in the last 30 years, which is game theory. So today we're going to talk about game theory. Game theory is a tool of economics uh, that was not really used early in economics, but has come to dominate, uh, has come to dominate theoretical economics over the past 30 or 40 years. Okay? And basically, the way that game theory works is to think literally of oligopolistic firms as engaging in a game. So when you play, don't want to say play Monopoly, that sort of could be confusing terms, when you play Sorry or whatever uh, with someone or play some online game with someone, you're competing to win, you're behaving non-cooperatively, you're competing to win. And so, the, so basically, what the insights of game theory are that the, all, the, all the tools we use strategically to make decisions in playing games can actually be used in modeling how firms compete non-cooperatively in an oligopolistic market. And the key point is that the key um, insight is that each firm will develop a strategy. Just as when you're playing chess, you have some strategy going in. Okay? Firms will develop a strategy. And that based on that strategy, they will determine their behavior. Okay? And basically, what is going to determine that behavior is going to be how firm strategies combine to determine a market outcome. How to, when firms come in with different strategies, or with a bunch of firms with strategies come in and compete with each other, what determines the market outcome? And what that's going to depend on is something we call an equilibrium concept. which is how do we measure, essentially, the equilibrium concept is basically in game theory terms. Think about how do we determine when the game's over? How do we determine when we've sort of decided on the outcome of a market? What's the equilibrium concept? So when you're reading the rules of a game, of a new game, you look for, the first thing you look for is how do you decide who wins? That's kind of like what the equilibrium concept is. It's sort of what determines whether the game has ended? What determines whether you've reached uh, equilibrium, where you've reached a point where the market is stable and therefore the game is ended. Not end in the sense the firm shut down, but end in the sense that you know what everybody's doing. So it's not quite like winning or losing. It's more just like what determines when you're in the point where, you're, uh, where that market is at equilibrium. Okay? Now the most famous concept is due to John Nash, who many of you heard of from the movie and book A Beautiful Mind, and that's called the Nash Equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium okay, is, is the point at which no firm wants to change its strategy given what the other firms are doing. Let me say that again. A Nash equilibrium is the point where no firm wants to change its strategy given what the other firms are doing. It's a little bit bizarre, but we'll, we'll work it out. Okay? In other words, more formally, the idea is that holding constant the strategies that all your competitors use, given the strategies all your competitors use, there's nothing that I can do to raise my profits further. Given the strategies all my competitors are playing, there's no strategy I can choose that will make me more profitable than the one I'm choosing. And likewise, for every player in the market, that'll turn out to be true. So think about players sitting around a game board going around the circle. Each player says, given what I know each of the rest of you are doing, I'm doing the best thing I can. And then you go around the circle and everybody says, OK, I'm at that point. You've reached a stable Nash equilibrium. Okay? And this was named, of course, for John Nash. Uh, you all know the story of John Nash, who's a famous actually mathematician. Uh, uh, really, we use his tools in economics, but he was a mathematician, uh, developed these incredible theories, and then uh, developed schizophrenia and went crazy, uh, but not before. Uh, he developed some of the most important concepts in both mathematics and economics. Uh, the most important is, is the Nash equilibrium. Now, the best illustration we use of the Nash equilibrium um, is an example that we refer to as the prisoner's dilemma. And many of you will be familiar with this from uh, more popular reading you've done in economics, but let me just go through it because it's important to understand it. The prisoner's dilemma. So the prisoner's dilemma um, 
comes from the old way, uh, the title comes from the old way they used to make police movies, where the idea is you catch two guys in a crime, um, you can't put them away unless one of them fesses up. So what you do is you put them each in a separate room, and you say to the one, you know, your buddy's cracked. He's, he, he's, he's going he's gonna to sell you down the river. You know, you better, uh, you, you know, all, well, I'm using all my 50s analogies. He's going to put you away for good. Uh, but, but if you, if you admit that he's guilty and he did the crime, we'll let you off with a light sentence. Then they go to the other room and say the same thing to the other guy, hoping they'll both rat on each other and they can both get a, get a, uh, get a, get a sentence. So basically the idea is, so basically, um, let's say that uh, you walk into one room, you walk into each room, you say to each person, look, we have enough evidence right here, and you show them, to send you each to prison for a year. Okay? We have enough evidence to send you each to prison for a year. But if you, we aren't sure about this other thing. If you'll admit that your friend did this other thing, then he'll go for five years and you'll go free. Then we go to the friend and we say the same thing. If you'll admit that your friend did the other thing, he'll go five years and you'll go free. But if they both admit, then they both go for two years. Okay? So if they both admit, they both go for two years. Now the way to write this down, what we do to, to explain this, is we write down what we call a payoff matrix. Okay? So write down a payoff matrix. So the idea is we have prisoner A here and prisoner B here. And they each have an option. They can remain silent or they can talk. Silent or talk. Okay. Now, if they both remain silent, if they both say, I would never rat out my friend, I'm happy to go to jail for a year rather than rat out my friend, then they each get one year in jail. A equals one, B equals one. However, if prisoner A rats out his buddy and prisoner B chooses not to rat out his buddy, then A gets, um, uh, so if prisoner, I'm sorry, if prisoner A talks and prisoner B remains silent, prisoner A talks, prisoner B remains silent, then A gets zero, but B gets five years in prison. Okay? On the other hand, if prisoner B rats out his friend, but prisoner A is, is true and doesn't say anything, then prisoner A is going to get stuck with five years, and prisoner B is going to get nothing. And if they both rat each other out, then they both get two years. Okay. So that's people understand the payoff. Are there questions about the setup here? This is complicated, so gotta make sure you understand the setup. Okay. Now, can someone tell me if A and B could truthfully cooperate, what would be the optimal cooperative strategy? Yeah. Right, you'd both be silent. So the optimal cooperative strategy is clear, which is to both be silent. So if the cops said, you know what, we'll let you guys get together and discuss what you want to do first, which the cops would never be stupid enough to do. But if they did, and the guys could trust each other, then that's the optimal cooperative strategy. OK? And we call that, what we call optimal in the context, in the language of game theory, we call that the dominant strategy. A dominant strategy. A dominant strategy, okay, is the best thing to do no matter what the other guy does. Okay, it's the dominant strategy. So the dominant cooperative equilibrium strategy is to both stay quiet. But what's the dominant non-cooperative strategy? What is the dominant non-cooperative strategy? Okay, so let's think about, so the ways of the dominant strategy we run through Take prisoner A, ask the following. The dominant strategy is, is there a strategy that makes him better off regardless of what B does? Is there a strategy that makes A better off regardless of what B does? Let's go through. If A remains silent, okay? If B remains silent, he gets a year. If B talks, he gets five years. Now compare that to prisoner A's strategy of talking. Well, if he talks, he's better off than if he doesn't talk, if B's remaining silent. If he talks, 
he's better off than if he doesn't talk if B talks. That is, regardless of what B does, he's better off talking. Regardless of what B chooses to do, his dominant strategy is to talk. Because if B is silent, he's better off if he talks. If B talks, he's better off if he talks. So no matter what B chooses to do, A is better off talking. Okay? What about B? Well, B, by the same logic, is always better off talking as well. No matter what A chooses to do, B is better off if he talks. So where do we end up? What ends up as the, as the Nash equilibrium? The Nash equilibrium is that both prisoners talk. The dominant strategy for both prisoners is to talk. And they both end up worse off than they could have, if they could have cooperated. So the dominant non-cooperative strategy is to both talk. Even though if they could get together, OK? Even though if they could get together, they'd be better both not talking. And this is based on how game theory works. Game theory math gets incredibly hard. And if you're interested, 1412 is one of our most popular undergraduate courses, game theory. It's a great course where you take this and go run with it for a whole semester. It gets very complicated mathematically. But basically, the basic idea in game theory is pretty straightforward, which is just ask, are there dominant strategies that can be played by each player? If each player has a dominant strategy, and those dominant strategies lead to a Nash equilibrium, then you're done. Here, we're in a Nash equilibrium. Why are we in a Nash equilibrium? Because given that A has talked, B's strategy, which is talking, is the optimal thing to do. Given that B has talked, A's strategy, which is talking, is the optimal thing to do. So given what the other person's doing, each person's doing the right thing. So you're Nash equilibrium. Okay. Given that B has chosen to talk, A is talking. That's the, that's the profit maximizing thing to do. Given that A is talking, B is talking, that's the profit maximizing thing to do. So given the strategy the other player's chosen, that's an equilibrium. Yeah? No, no, but if they both no, if they both talk, that's not the ten years only happens if one talks and the other one doesn't. No, I mean, like, oh, 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 if they both have they got ten years? Yeah. Okay, great. So let's ask that. Let's change this. Now let's just let's just rework it. Okay? So now what's A's choice? Well, A, if he talks and B silent, then he's better talking. But if he talks and B talks, he's worse talking. So then what he does depends on what B does. What B does can depend on what A does. And we, don't, we can't obviously see the Nash equilibrium here. We don't because there's no dominant strategy. What you do depends on what the other person does. So there's no dominant strategy. Dominant strategies only occur if there's something that you should do no matter what the other person does. So in this case where these are both two, there is a dominant strategy. It's to talk. If those are both 10, there is no longer dominant strategy. So we, don't get, we can't quickly get the Nash equilibrium. OK, good. that's a good question. OK, now, this is not just a cute example that you can use for prisoners, but actually explains firm behavior in many contexts. So the best example I like to think of of this is to think about advertising. Okay? So imagine you have Coke and Pepsi. And imagine a world where Pepsi was as popular as Coke. That should never happen. Coke's way better. But imagine that was that world. Okay? So imagine a world where if there was no advertising, then basically Pepsi and Coke would split the market 50-50. Okay, imagine that setup. So if Pepsi and Coke could agree not to advertise, they'd split the market 50-50. Okay? However, it's going to turn out that while that may be the dominant cooperative outcome, that's not the dominant non-cooperative outcome because each firm is better off advertising if the other one doesn't, uh, or regardless. So for example, imagine with the following payoff matrix. I'm just making this up, okay? But here you have Pepsi. And here you have Coke. And imagine the payoff metrics. And the payoff metric matrix is if they don't advertise, if they don't advertise, then um, if, they, if Pepsi does, so Pepsi can choose not to advertise or it can advertise. OK? So if they both don't advertise, Pepsi gets 8 and Coke gets 8. I don't know what 80 is. 80 is billion dollars. I'm just making up numbers here. It doesn't matter. So eight billion dollars each. Okay. If they both do advertise, then they still end up splitting the market because basically they're just as good as each other. So they both spend all the money advertising and just back up where they would have started. 
except they've wasted all this money in advertising. So if they both advertise, they each learn $3 billion instead of $8 billion. That is, they each split the market. They end up back where they would have started, but they pissed away a bunch of money advertising along the way. However, if Coke advertises and Pepsi doesn't, then Coke makes, then all of a sudden everybody sees Coke, Coke, Coke everywhere. Everyone's like, Pepsi, I never heard of that. Okay? Coke makes $13 billion and Pepsi loses $2 billion. And likewise, if Coke doesn't advertise but Pepsi does, people are like, I never heard of Coke, I'm going to drink Pepsi. Okay? So Pepsi makes 13 and Coke makes minus 2. Once again, the numbers, I just made numbers here so it work, but these aren't real world examples. Okay? So once again, we can see there's a dominant cooperative strategy, which is they both should agree, let's not advertise. Okay? But if they're not, if they can't cooperate, then in fact, what's the national equilibrium? Well, let's work it through. And this, there's no shortcuts here, you've just got to work this through. So let's look for Pepsi. Well, Pepsi says if Coke doesn't advertise, I'm better off advertising. If Coke does advertise, I'm better off advertising. So my dominant strategy is to advertise. Coke says, well, gee, if Pepsi doesn't advertise, if Pepsi doesn't advertise, I'm better off advertising. I make 13 instead of 8. If Pepsi does advertise, I make 3 instead of negative 2, so I'm better off advertising 2. So my dominant strategy is to advertise. So for both firms, the dominant non-cooperative strategy is to advertise. So they both advertise, you end up in this equilibrium. Okay? It's an example of how a non-cooperative equilibrium can lead to what we call a race to the bottom. You can think of this as a race to the bottom. In other words, if they could cooperate, they could just be better off. But because they can't trust the other, there's this race to the bottom where they both end up worse off. Okay? This is pretty striking. And this is sort of striking. I thought they brought this out well in, in, in The Beautiful Mind, both the movie and the book, which is that all we've learned about economics so far is that competition is good, right? Competition is beneficial. Well, here's a case where, in fact, at least from the firm's perspective, competition's bad. Okay, if they could just get together and cooperate, they could, uh, they could make more money. Okay? Now, in fact, this example is not so far-fetched. I don't know when it started, but it was during your lifetimes. When you were young, okay, hard liquors, scotch, bourbon, uh, whiskey, etc., did not advertise on television. You never saw a Johnny Walker ad or anything on television. Okay? Until, I don't know when it changed, maybe five or six years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I don't know, but certainly in your lifetimes. That was not by government regulation. Many people thought there was a government regulation they couldn't. That was not. That was a cooperative equilibrium where the makers of hard liquors got together and agreed not to advertise on TV. And they said it was in the public interest, yada, 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 but that wasn't. Okay? It was just they recognized the benefits of cooperating and not wasting money advertising on TV and competing with each other. Well, that broke down some number of years ago, and now you see whiskey ads and scotch ads and other things on television, and they've moved to this non-cooperative equilibrium uh, where they're all losing money by having this advertising. Okay? So, that's, um, so that's, uh, that's an advertising. For me, you know, once again, this is a hard thing at all, what intuition works for you. For me, the intuition works best, maybe for my scars from my dating life, is thinking about personal decisions. Okay? So imagine that uh, there's some girl named Allison, and Allison has a potential problem with her boyfriend. Okay? They've had a fight, and now she's deciding whether or not to make up or break up. Make up or break up. Now, we can think of this just like Coke and Pepsi. Alice is going to be thinking, well, gee, if he wants to make up with me and I want to make up with him, then we're both better off. But if I want to make up with him and he doesn't want to make up with me, that makes me look like a total idiot. Whereas if I break up with him preemptively, you know, yes, it would be sad if he wanted to break up, if he wanted to stay with me, but at least if he wanted to break up with me, I'll look better. So she preemptively breaks up with him. John, her boyfriend, thinking the same thing, does, behaves in exactly the same way. So it could be that even though they both would be better off if they just said, look, the honest truth is, you know, we're both wrong, let's make up and we'll both be happy. Because they're so afraid of being the one being dumped, they end up breaking up. Now we all know of examples like this from life, where people basically, stupidly, if they could have just cooperated a better outcome, because they're so afraid of being left with the short end of the stick, they don't cooperate and you end up with a worse outcome for both. That's an example of a non-cooperative equilibrium okay, in real life. Now, in real life, there is one aspect of oligopolistic non-cooperative equilibria 
that allow them to be enforced, however, that allow you to overcome the prisoner's dilemma. There's one thing that allows you to overcome the prisoner's dilemma, and that's repeated games. Repeated games can help you overcome the prisoner's dilemma. Okay? Now, let's take the Coke and Pepsi example. Okay? And let's imagine um, that they're making the advertising decision every period. Every period, they have to make an independent advertising decision. Okay? They can advertise and advertise every period. Okay? And imagine Coke says to Pepsi, I've got the following d deal for you. I commit to not advertise as long as you don't. But the minute you advertise, I'm going to advertise forever. Okay? So as long as you don't advertise, I won't. But if you ever run an ad, the bets are off and I'm never going to cooperate with you. I'm going to advertise forever. Well, let's think about Pepsi's choice in period one, if Coke presents them with this deal. Let's think about Pepsi's choice if Coke presents them with this deal. OK. Well, one thing is they can say, ha ha, great Coke. Good, good job trusting me. I'm going to screw you and advertise in period one. So Pepsi could say, great. Coke's laid down arms in period one. I'm going to go ahead and advertise. I'll make 13 in period one because Coke's wimped out. And then I'll make three forever after. Because forever after, we're both going to advertise. But at least I beat them up that first period. However, Pepsi says, wait a second. If Coke's really right, honest, then I can get a equilibrium where we make eight forever. And certainly, eight forever is a better deal than 13 one year and three forever. So in fact, if Coke's willing to live up to that promise, then that is a good deal. And actually, we can turn this non-cooperative equilibrium into cooperative equilibrium through the enforcement of a repeated game. Through the fact that this game gets played over and over and over again, okay, the fact that this game, play, game gets played over and over and over again, you can enforce a cooperative equilibrium. We can come back to relationships again. If you're in a committed relationship and you know that if I say it's your fault over and over again, eventually the person's going to leave, then people say, gee, I'm willing to take some of the blame and not always say it's your fault and we have a fight. Because I know that if I always say it's your fault, ultimately that'll break the relationship up and that makes me worse off than admitting it was my fault some of the time. It's the same logic. Yeah? To make more than the other guy or to make as much as possible? Make as much as possible. Okay. Make as mu that's a good point. I presume that the point is to make as much as possible and you don't, I, I presume, I, I'm ruling out cut off your nose to spite your face equilibria. So in other words, I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming the goal is to maximize profits, not relative market position. A good point. I should have made that assumption clear. That's the assumption we're always doing. The assumption we're always making whenever we do confirm behavior is we're assuming it's profit maximization. So repeated games can enforce a cooperative equilibria, essentially, even in a non cooperative setup. But it turns out this only works if the game goes on forever. Okay? This only works if the game's going to go on forever. So, for example, Imagine that Pepsi knows that in 10 years, the US government is going to ban the advertisement of sugared sodas. The US government is going to finally say, look, people are too obese. No more advertising sugary sodas. Okay. Pepsi knows this. In 10 years, that's going to happen. Well, Pepsi's thinking, gee, that means in year 10, I should advertise. In that last year, I should advertise because Coke can't punish me the next year because no one can advertise the next year. So I know starting after 10 years, we're both in this equilibrium because the government's going to enforce it. So in the ninth year, right beforehand, right before that government ban, I should advertise. And Coke can't, can't get me the next period because they don't have the tool to punish me. Well, Coke, of course, knows Pepsi's going to behave that way. So Coke says, wait a second, if Pepsi's going to behave that way, then I better advertise in the ninth period too, or I'm going to get hit with a minus two. So I'm going to advertise in the ninth period too. Well, Pepsi says, look, if Coke's going to advertise in the ninth period for sure, I may as well advertise in the eighth period. Because Coke's going to advertise in the ninth period for sure. And by the same logic, you can work it back that they'll both advertise right away and you'll end up with a non-cooperative equilibrium. That is a repeated game that ends, d does not enforce the cooperative equilibrium. Because by wor that, working that logic backwards, if it ends in some realistic time frame, then you're better off just breaking it now rather than waiting, waiting for that period where you're the one who loses. Yeah. Exactly. No, if, if, if they don't, then you could imagine that if Pepsi knows this and Coke doesn't, 
then Pepsi's optimal strategy will be to cooperate till the next to last period and then go ahead and screw Coke and then Coke will lose. But presuming symmetric information, repeated games cannot enforce these equilibria if, if they end. Okay, so this is just an incredibly quick introduction, okay, to the fun that is game theory. Okay, we're going to go on now and do sort of more rigorous versions of these models. But this is sort of just to get you excited about the tools you can do with game theory. These kind of fun examples. Game theory is about taking these fun examples and thinking a lot harder about a lot. What if there's asymmetric information? What if someone knows? What if the game ends long enough in the future that you're willing to be patient? How far off in the future does the game have to end to still enforce the cooperative equilibrium? What if there are three players? What if players move in different orders? What if one player goes first, the second player responds to that, it's different than if they go simultaneously? These are all really interesting issues that are very relevant to the real world firm behavior that you learn about in game theory. So this is sort of just to kind of whet your appetite for that. Okay. Having done that, we're going to now turn, leave aside these more interesting dynamic issues and focus on a specific example of a non-cooperative oligopoly. Okay. Because once again, this is all sort of fun intuitively, but we want you to be able to work through a problem. And the way to work that through is we're going to have to move to a specific simplified example. Okay? And the example we're going to focus on is called the Cournot model. The Cournot model of non-cooperative equilibria, non-cooperative oligopoly. Okay? The way we're going to do this here is we're going to return to the example we had with the prisoner's dilemma. But instead of just facing two choices, talk or not talk, we're talking about firms pacing a whole continuum of choices, firms choosing how much they produce in a non-cooperative equilibrium situation. So for example, let's take the example I used in the book. Let's imagine there's two airlines that fly between New York and Chicago, American and United. And let's imagine for simplicity those are the only two airlines. Because of the hub and spoke system we talked about last time, let's say all the gates in Chicago and New York all the gates in Chicago that are available to come from New York are taken by two airlines, United and American. Those are your only two options, okay? New York to flying New York to Chicago, okay? And the question you want to ask is, did in that world, how do United and American decide how many flights to run and what price to charge, okay? If there are monopolies, we'd know. If there's a competition, we'd know. But how do they decide this oligopolistic, okay? And the way they do this is by Looking for, the way we figure this out is by looking for the Nash equilibrium in this case, which we also call Cournot equilibrium, okay? which is basically we choose the quantity for each firm. The quantity for each firm is chosen. Quantity is chosen by each firm such that holding all other firms' quantities constant. So each firm chooses quantity such that holding all other firms' quantities constant, they are maximizing profits. So I choose a quantity such that holding all the other firms' quantities constant, I'm, ma I'm choosing a profit maximizing quantity. Okay? And if each firm can choose a quantity, that makes the market function where this, to, where this is met, then you're in Cournot equilibrium. Okay, you're in Cournot equilibrium where each firm has decided I'm happy. It's the same as the Nash concept. I'm happy with what I'm, with what I'm producing. I'm profiting with what they're producing, given what everybody else is producing. If everybody feels that way, then you're in a Nash equilibrium or Cournot equilibrium. Okay? So to see this, this is not immediately intuitive. Let me just talk to the steps of how you'd solve for this. Okay, how do you actually solve for Cournot equilibrium? Okay, the first step is, so basically what are the steps to solving? Step one for solving Cournot equilibrium is to ask, is to create each firm's residual demand. So compute residual demand. We talked about residual demand curves earlier, which is that's the demand for my firm given the sort of quantity absorbed by other firms in the market. Okay, in this case, it's quantities are by the one other firm in the market. But in general, you can do this with multiple players. First is you calculate residual demand. Okay? Then, 
having computer resi your, your, your residual demand, okay, you basically develop a marginal revenue function. You calculate your marginal revenue, which will be a function of other firms' quantities. So your residual demand will you lead you to calculate a marginal revenue function. It's a function of other firms' quantities. Okay? You then do the same, do 1 and 2 for all firms. So for each firm, you end up with a marginal revenue function. It's a function of all of the firm's quantities. And then that leaves you, step four, is you have n equations in n unknowns, and you solve. Okay? So basically, you develop a series of equations where each firm's marginal revenue function is a function of each other firm's quantities. You get one equation like that for each firm. That leads you to n equations and unknowns you solve. If you can solve it, then you reach equilibrium. If you don't have a solution, then there is no stable Nash equilibrium. But if you can solve that, then there is a Cournot equilibrium, and you solve for it. Okay? So what we're going to do here is I'm going to illustrate this to you graphically today, and we'll work through, the math, we'll work through some more of the math of it next time. Okay? So we'll start, we'll start by doing this graphically. Okay? So we're going to consider the case Let's start by considering the case of American Airlines. OK, let's start with figure 16.1. Start by considering the case of American Airlines. OK, now imagine, and let's say that the demand curve faced by the demand curve in this market, in our example, we're going to do, let's say that uh, the demand curve is of the form P equals 339 minus Q. So there's 339,000 flights that are demanded each month. Each month, there are 339,000 flights demanded in the whole market. Okay. So 339,000 people want to go from New York to Chicago every month. Okay. And let's also assume the marginal cost is $147. I don't know where Perloff came up with these numbers, but let's just go with them. The specific numbers don't matter. Okay. Now. So what would American Airlines do if it was a monopolist? If American Airlines was a monopolist, it would set marginal revenues, which are 339 minus 2Q, by the same math we did before. You just multiply it through by Q and then differentiate, and you get 339 minus 2Q, equal the marginal cost, which is 147. Okay, So it would choose a quantity of 96. If it was a monopolist, it would choose a quantity of 96, OK? And it would choose a price of $243. A price of $243, which we just get off the demand curve. If the quantity is 96, the price is 243. OK? And that's what we see here. OK? The marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve, where uh, at the quantity of 96,000, you then go up to the demand curve to read off the price. Remember, from Monopolis, you've got to still respect the demand curve. Go up to the demand curve to read off the price, that's 243. That's what American would do if they were a monopolist. So if they were the only folks flying from North to Chicago, New York to Chicago, they fly 96,000 people a month at a price of 243,000. OK? However, now let's say American recognizes that United's in the market. And let's say American recognizes that United is going to deliver some amount of flights Q sub U. They know America's going to do some amount of flights Q sub U. They don't quite know yet what it is, but they know there's going to be some amount of flights Q sub U. Okay. So the residual demand for American is Q sub A equals total demand minus Q sub U. That's their residual demand. Okay. So for example, let's say that American just guesses that United will fly 64,000 passengers. Let's say American says, look, I just know I got some, you know, some uh, corporate spy who's told me that United will fly 64,000 passengers. Okay? So what you want to do is then you just resolve the problem by using the residual demand. So then I say, well, if United is going to fly 64,000 passengers, then my residual demand 
is that price equals 339 minus the quantity I sell, Q sub A, minus Q sub U, which I think is 64,000, which is 64. So my new residual demand is P, okay, my new residual demand is P equals 275 minus Q sub A. That's my new residual demand, because I thought United's going to scale 64,000. So instead of my demand being 339 minus Q, now it's 275 minus Q sub A. Okay, that's what's left. Okay, so if I use this as my new demand function and resolve, then my, if I use my new demand function, my marginal revenues are then 275 minus 2QA. Okay, my marginal cost is the same, which is 147. Okay, so now this is my new, instead of my optimization equation being 339 minus Q, 2Q equals 147. Now it's 275 minus 2QA equals 147. Okay, if I do that, I'm going to get a QA star, QA star of 64,000 flights. I'm going to say, well, look, I, if I was a monopolist, I would deliver 96,000 flights. But given that United is delivering 64,000, then it's going to be optimal for me to also deliver 64,000. At 64,000 flights, what's my price going to be? Well, my price is 275 minus QA. So my price could be 211. So I'm going to deliver 60. If I think United is delivering 64,000 flights, then I'm going to deliver 64,000 flights at a price of $211. OK? So that's basically um, how American would function. Now, what's strange about this is American doesn't know how many flights United is going to deliver. There isn't such a thing. In fact, United really, it's not like there's some rule which says we're going to deliver 64,000. United's figure, trying to figure this out too. So in fact, simultaneously to American making this decision, United is making the same decision. And they're going through the exact same math. They're saying, well, gee, given how much American flies, how much should we fly? OK? They're going through the same math. And in fact, if we assume that both firms have to face the same marginal cost and the same demand curve. That in fact, they're solving a symmetric problem. They are also creating a residual demand function, but instead of being QA equals D minus QU, now United is making QU equals D minus QA. They're making a parallel residual demand function, and they are solving as well. And both firms, therefore, are ending up with choice of quantities that depend on the other firm's quantity. Okay? And in particular, what they're developing is they're developing, um, they're developing what we call a best response curve. So figure 16.2, I skipped over figure 16.2. This is just illustrates what happens. Figure 16.2 illustrates what happens when America thinks United's committing 64,000. Let's go through that in one second. Did through it mathematically. But this is an example. This is an example where America knows United's doing 64,000 flights. So they say, well, look, my residual demand is essentially this new line, D super R. And that's why I choose on that new line. I then look, so that creates a new marginal revenue curve, MR super R. That new marginal revenue curve intersects marginal cost at 64,000. And that's why I fly only 64,000 flights at a flight at price of 211. So you see here's one example of how, given an amount United's flying, how American chooses how much to fly. OK? Questions about that? Graphics, that ties to the math I did here. What figure 16.3 does is say, look, we can actually do this for a whole host of possible production levels by the other firm. And we can develop what we call best response curves. OK? Best response curves are, given what the other firm does, what should I do? So for example, American's best response curve is given that so on the x-axis, we have um, how many thousands of flights American, pa American passengers are flying per quarter. On the y-axis, how many thousands of flights United passengers are flying per quarter. OK? So for example, if American decides to fly zero flights, OK, um, then United should fly 96 flights, right? Then United's a monopolist. 
So that's the point on the, on the y-axis, the 96, 0 point on the curve, with a 0 on the x-axis, 96 on the y-axis. If American decides to fly 0, United should fly 96. That's the monopoly case we just solved. If American decides to fly 64, United should fly 64. That's the case we just solved as well. Likewise, American's best response curve is this steeper line. But it's the same thing. If United flies 0, American should fly 96. That's 0 on the y-axis, 96 on the x-axis. So if United flies 0, okay, American should fly 96. If United flies 64, American should fly 64. So you can actually literally trace out these curves, asking at every single point, given what the other guy's doing, what should I do? So we solved for two points on this curve. We solved for the other guy producing 0 point, which is you produce 96. We solved for the other guy producing 64 point, which is you produce 64. That same math can be solved for every point on this curve. Yeah? The 192 point is sort of an odd, it's the question's the following. At what point would United produce, at what point would American produce zero? How much would United have to produce for American to produce zero? Well, they'd only produce zero if United was taking the entire, if United was producing 192,000. Okay, only at that point would they actually say, forget it, we're just going to produce, uh, we're just going to produce zero. That's what the 192 point means. So you'd need, uh, uh, only, only if they knew United was producing all that much would they just drop out of the market. Okay, so that, that, that's the 192 intersection. It's sort of a backwards way to read the curves. But the bottom line is, essentially, we can write these best response curves as the, they're basically the quantity I'm going to produce given the quantity the other firm produces. And the key thing is that these are symmetric in this example. Since the costs are the same, and they both face the same market demand, okay, then these curves are symmetric. Okay, these curves are symmetric. What that means is that you can, these, these curves are going to, you know, having figured out one, you can automatically draw the other. A trick for solving these problems is if you have a symmetric Cournot equilibrium, you don't need to calculate the math by each firm's best response curve. Once you calculate one, you know the other firm's just the complement of it. Okay, so having calculated this American's best response curve, we could have automatically drawn the United best response curve as the complement of that. Okay? The other key point is by drawing this diagram, we can see the Cournot equilibrium. Remember Cournot equilibrium. Cournot equilibrium is where I'm happy with my quantity given what the other firm's doing. Given what the other firm's doing, I can't make any more money. Once again, I don't care about market share, I just care about money. Okay, so given what the other firm's doing, I can't make any more money. Well, that happens at 64,000 each. Because when Americans produce 64,000, United's happy to produce 64,000. That's their profit maximizing choice. If United's produce 64,000, Americans happen to produce 64,000. That's their profit maximizing choice. So that point of each producing 64,000, we are in a Nash or Cournot equilibrium. Both firms are happy given what the other firm is doing. Both firms are profit maximizing given what the other firm is doing. Okay? Now, so basically, for example, another way to look at this is that you're only in equilibrium if you're on both firms' reaction curves. So for example, um, American might say, look, the, the equilibrium I like is where I do 96,000 flights and you do none. So the equilibrium I like is on the x-axis uh, the point 96,0, where I do 96,000 flights and you United do none. United says, however, United says, no, that's not optimal for me. Because if you're doing that, then you're charging a price of $243. So there's money to be made for me. I can come in and start stealing some of your flights. So that's not an equilibrium from my perspective. It might be an equilibrium from your perspective. You're delighted you're a monopolist. But not from my perspective. At that price, I'll come in and start stealing some of your business. And I'm going to start stealing some of your business. As I steal your business, you are going to have to move up your best response curve. Okay, because I'm taking, because your residual demand is shrinking. And you'll only reach equilibrium when you're both happy with the outcome. If only one firm's happy with the outcome, the other firm can always change its behavior, raise its price up or down or its quantity up or down to change the market share and change the outcome. So equilibrium will only be when you're both firm's best response curves. You'll only be on both firm's best response curves where they intersect. Okay? 
Let's stop there. I'm going to come back next time. Um, and uh, Jessica, we should have the same handout next time. Uh, let's make sure this figure's in the handout next time as well. Um, and we'll come back and talk about this last figure, and we'll do the math behind it as well.